Okay, we're ready. Yes, okay, sir. good morning, everyone. I call this Utah Transportation Commission meeting on Friday, May 22nd, 2020, in order. And let us start with, I will offer the Pledge of Allegiance. Just remember it is a Memorial Weekend and feel that spirit and feel those loved ones that we have lost all these many years and they have given us the life to live. So I'm gonna be asking you to look at the picture behind me and the flag. <laughs> Please all rise and bye. Aye. 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 Thank you. And and for those of the chiming in, we have a live broadcast of this meeting. It's on the youtube.com slash Utah DOT. Hopefully thousands will join us soon. Okay. The first item of the agenda is introduction. Well, let me just get the policy again in place. Just remember, we are doing this 100% electronic based on the executive order of the Governor Herbert which was issued March 18, 2020. So while we have that exact order, I have to ask each commission, of course, to make sure we have a quorum. And once we have everybody in, I will ask everyone to make sure that they are all plugged in, that they listen and they also, they hear. And if you don't any have any, have any questions or problems with the microphone in hearing the presentations and the questions, please let me know that we can stop and repeat the question. And at the end of the meetings, I will also call a roll call to make sure everybody was there and attentive and all the votes were all taken. And also I would like to make sure that everybody understand that, that this time, because of the time and because we're gonna allow the commission of government to go home early, I'm not gonna ask for seven I vote. I'm gonna ask for nay only. If anybody has a nay, then we'll call it unanimous after that. Okay, so with that, I would like to make sure that we have a roll call to make sure everyone present. Let's start with the commission, uh, Commissioner Barlow. I'm on board. Thank you. Commissioner Kramer. Yes, sir. I'm here. Commissioner Law. I'm here. Commissioner Evans. You know, I am here. If Freddie Mercury and Queen were around, this is how they would have done this song because of our UDOT employees, okay? Okay. <laughs> Not employees are champions, my friends. <laughs> we are always moving to the end. Other states try to follow them. COVID won't stop them. You dot employees, <laughs> they are the champions to the end. After a little who uh, there are some of these great responders that keep us moving, keep the first responders moving wherever they need to go. By the way, Jim Evans, Region Three. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Commissioner Van Tassel? I am here, thank you. Commissioner Gardner? Uh, good morning, I'm here, Nagi. Uh, I represent Region 2. Thank you, my friend, thank you very much. So we're all here then. I would like to have a uh, motion to proceed electronic meeting and I need a second on that, please. So moved by Commissioner Evans. Okay. Thank second. you, Barlow. Thank you. Is there any nay vote against electronic meeting? No. Seeing none, I'll proceed and that means unanimous approval. Thank you. Okay, next item of agenda is introduction. So now this time I'd like to ask commissioner to introduce themselves and the region that they present, represent. So start with commissioner Barlow, please. My name is Wayne Barlow. I represent Region 1, which is the six northernmost counties of the state from Box Elder down through Davis County. I live in Cache Valley. Thank you. Commissioner Kramer. Commissioner Kramer, I live in downtown Salt Lake City. I have the privilege to be commissioner at large, and I saw much of the state last weekend safely distancing uh, in a car with my wife. Delighted to be here. Thank you.
I think you call Donna. Donna Nagy. Nagy. Uh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, Donna Law. I'm a commissioner at large. I make my home in quiet uh, Cedar City, Utah. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Evans. Commissioner Evans, Region 3. I live in Orem and I represent the east to west to east from the central part of the, of the state, the counties. Thank you. And Commissioner Van Tassel. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Van Tassel, I'm a state at large bill commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Gochner. Good morning, Natalie Gochner. I'm coming to you from Murray, Utah. I represent uh, Region 2, which is Tooele, Salt Lake, and Summit counties under the very able leadership of Brian Adams. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> and my name is Nagi Zinari. I'm chiming in from sunny and cool St. George. And on behalf of the leadership and the citizens of the Washington County, I express my love and gratitude for all of you who attended and the Utah family and everyone that working so hard to save our lives on the freeways. Thank you and happy Memorial Weekend to everyone. At this time, I would like to recognize also our federal highway partners, Ivan Morero. And I don't know, did the Brigitte check in? Brigitte is listening in on the uh, YouTube. Okay, welcome both of you. Thank you for being here and helping us always. Uh, Carlos, would you mind introducing our UDOT family? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will, uh, I will go down the list as it appears here in the uh, video conferencing that we're on. And uh, we won't ask that they get on and introduce themselves. That would take too long. So okay. uh, we have Ben Hewitt, who is a group leader uh, working in uh, planning and programming area. And um, we have Brad Palmer, who is a program manager out of our Region 2 office. Brian Adams, who has already received sufficient recognition, I believe, but he's our <laughs> Region 2 director. Carmen Swanwick, he's the deputy director of Region 2 and probably the one who's responsible for Brian's uh, success. Uh, Charles Stormont is our director of Right Away. Elaine, Elaine, Elaine Barron is a communications out of our um, planning and investment um, deputy director underneath Terry. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Grant Potter, he's in our communications division and he's taking care of the uh, technology here for this meeting and the YouTube coordination. Heather Barthol, she's the commission secretary and uh, the one who's responsible for all the logistics behind the commission meetings. Ivan Hartle is in our programming area. And as you know, he'll be conducting a good part of the, uh, this, the meeting here today. Uh, Jared Esselman, who's our director of aviation, who had a uh, did a nice job yesterday uh, in the in the staff update meeting. Jason Davis, deputy director for engineering and operations. Uh, Jordan Lee, out of our technology and uh, innovation area, and um, I don't know if it was Jordan who provided um, Commissioner Gochner. That I noticed I didn't read it yet, but there was a note put in the chat there, maybe a a tip for the um, the video feed. Um, Cade Roberts, um, we heard from him last month, but he's the, uh, I'll still say fairly newly minted program manager out of uh, Region 4. Carrie Ann Noble also helping us with technology out of uh, technology and innovation. Uh, Chris Peterson, he's our uh, director of uh, project development. Uh, Linda Hull, policy director for the department. Lisa Wilson, who's our um, uh, director of Region 1. Lila McMillan who um, is uh, over our in, uh, division of investments, uh, innovative investments. I'll probably got his title wrong there. Sorry, Lyle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Matt Parker, um, program manager out of Region 3. Um, Rick Torgerson, project uh, direct, uh, Region 4 director. Sorry, Rick. Rob Clayton, Region 3 director. Rob White, he's our director of operations. Robert Pelly, STIP coordinator. Uh, Terry Ann Newell, who's our uh, deputy director for planning and investment. And uh, Mr. Chairman, that's all the UDOT folks I see present here on the meeting. Thank you. If we missed anyone, please forgive us. Thank you for being here with us. Item number two on your agenda is the local area presentation by Region 2. I don't have a name for it. 
This, this will be given by hey. Brad Palmer and Farnsworth. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So let me let me share my screen here. We'll get our presentation up. All right, is everyone able to see our PowerPoint? Yes, thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and commissioners. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Um, we were excited to present on the projects we've had in Summit County. I'm gonna talk about uh, recent projects we've had and upcoming ones, and then we'll turn the time over to Grant Farnsworth to talk about some studies that are ongoing up in the county. So just to give a little background on Summit County, this is one of three counties in Region 2. It's located in the northeast portion of the region. We currently, uh, or we have nine state routes in the county. Two of them inter are interstates, I-80 and I-84. And there's about 16 cities and towns within the county. And it's got a population of about 40,000 people. Some of the recent projects that we've had from 2018 to 2019, we um, have had four pavement projects, one capacity project, and one bridge rehabilitation project. And one of those that we want to highlight today is located here in the, in the southwest. This, this crosses the Salt Lake County border. It's our uh, Harley Summit to Jeremy Rash truck lane project. This was, so the, the scope of this was to add a truck lane from the Jeremy Ranch interchange up over the summit to get some, to get the trucks out of the general purpose lanes, get them over on the right so that as they slowed down going up those hills, we weren't impeding traffic. A few other scope items in this project, we also installed a noise wall on the north side of I-80 down by the Jeremy Ranch interchange. And then we've reported on this other piece in previous commission meetings, but the, the wildlife bridge just across the Salt Lake County line. This project began construction in the spring of 2018 and it, it completed in the summer of 2019 for a total project value of 21.4 million. We, I showed this video in our August area update, but I thought it'd be fun to watch again. I'm not sure if all the commissioners have been able to see it, but, whoops. There we go. So this, this is a video that was given to us by the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. They've had cameras out there just watching to see which types of animals and how many have been crossing the bridge. This structure out of the 21.4 million was about $5 million of the project budget. The bridge itself was completed in the fall of 2018 and it's about 50 feet wide and 320 feet long. You can see from the pictures, they, they did a really nice job trying to make the terrain across the bridge look as natural as possible. There's quite a diverse group of animals crossing this structure. One interesting thing about the bridge, uh, prior to its construction, we averaged about eight vehicle animal collisions a year in this area. Five of those would cause pretty significant damage to the, to the vehicles. And since the installation of the bridge, we've only had one reported animal hit. So we feel this has been a, a really good successful project thus far. Uh, moving on to our upcoming projects, there were, we, we've actually got 18 of them. There were too many to put on the slide here. I, I originally had them all listed out so you could see what they were, but it, it got really large and clunky, so I condensed it down. So we've got eight pavement projects coming up, five safety projects, three structure projects, and two maintenance projects scheduled for the area. 
And that, that gives a combined project value of about 57 million. We'll be constructing those over the next three years, starting this summer. Uh, first project we wanna highlight out of this group is our SR65 Hennifer, Hennifer Interchange Bridge Project. And then we'll take a look at our US-40 project that's at the I-80 interchange. And then we'll move down and look at project on SR-224. It's a wall repair project that came to us from our maintenance group. So our, our SR-65 project, this one was originally split into three projects. Um, a couple of years ago in our programming meetings as we were coordinating the different groups and what work they were proposing, three projects ended up in this area. They were in separate years, but they were so close together that we, we decided to combine them all into one project just to try to uh, keep, keep contractors off from overlapping and working on top of each other and also to see try, try to make some efficiencies in our bids. So just to talk a little bit about the scope of those three projects, our structures group was scheduled to replace this bridge on SR65 that crosses I-84. It, it met the end of its life, it's deteriorating and it's just ready for replacement. As part of that, they were also gonna do some rehabilitation work on the bridge that crosses the, the Weaver River. Um, our pavement group was scheduled to replace the asphalt from the Morgan County line down to the I-80 interchange. And that entailed still on top of that. Then our safety group came in and they wanted to install a cable barrier down the median to prevent those crossover type crashes. And, and part of that, if you look down on that bottom right picture, they're also going to install concrete barrier around this center vent just to prevent collisions with that structure that's in the median. So putting those three projects together, it gave us a project value of about 13.2 million. And this one actually just awarded last week. And luckily, or thankfully, our, our bids came in at about 500,000 under our engineer's estimate. So I, I think we were successful in combining those three to get the efficiencies we were hoping for. This will, construction will start this summer and conclude in the fall of 2021. Um, the next project on US 40 down at our down at the I 80 interchange. This this has been a challenging project for us. We've had settlement here on the roadway as you approach the bridges. So between the roadway interface and the approach slabs, we've we've experienced some settlement there that's created a, a, a pretty good bump if you drive across it fast. Uh, we, we've actually tried to advertise this project twice and both times the bids have come in higher than we were able to award. And part of that's due that the work that's required to, to correct this issue was only known with contractors outside of Utah. We didn't have any in-state expertise on how to fix this with the method we were proposing. So our bids kept coming in high. Recently, however, we have been able to get some contractors in the state that now have this expertise. Uh, expertise and so we're hopeful that that'll help drive our prices down. In addition to that, in the April STIP workshop, we proposed, Region 2 proposed, adding some scope to this project. So if you look at that barrier picture, you can see how dilapidated the barrier is on US 40 in this area. And our maintenance crews put this project forward requesting funds to replace all the concrete barrier through this section. So we, we proposed to use transportation solution funds to, to get that barrier fixed. And hopefully between, uh, by adding that scope and, and the two projects together, we'll be able to finally get this one awarded. So this one's scheduled to go out to advertising later this fall, and this construction would begin in the summer of 2021. Well, Rick, I can tell you one thing. You are now fixing the spot that I get the most comments on. We've we got quite a few comments on it also. <laughs> everyone that pulls a trailer through there complains to me. I've had that for three or four years. So thanks for getting on that. 
Yeah, this, this one's been tough for us to get awarded, but we're, we're hopeful. Our third project. Oh, Brad, excuse off. me. Yes. Could you, could you please a little bit more explanation why that section is uh, failing and why we couldn't find any local expert? What is the expertise needed? What kind of expert is needed to fix that problem? So talking to our structures group, they looked at a couple of different ways to, to fix this problem. And some of the conventional methods, um, they felt like were a little too risky. So typically you'd go in and you'd slab jack up those approach slabs that have settled. You, you'd lift them up and then fill it full of grout underneath to hold them level in place. The way that this bridge is constructed, it's got some retaining walls on the side and their fear was if they slab jacked it up and put the grout underneath, it might actually blow out those retaining walls. Okay. So the solution was to put a polyester concrete overlay across the roadway where it meets up with the approach slab. And that it, it basically, the, the approach slab and the roadway are still depressed but this concrete overlay fills in that gap and gives it a nice smooth top again. And, and that concrete polyester overlay just hadn't been done a lot in Utah previously. But over, over the last couple of years, we've, we've done it on the Black Rock project. It's gonna be used on the I-15 southbound project. So we're finally getting some contractors in the area that have that expertise. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Uh, our, our last project here that we have upcoming, this is on SR224 at about milepost 1.7. So this is south of Park City, heading up into the hills there. Um, our maintenance crews have been watching this retaining wall, if you can see on the bottom left picture. They've been monitoring this retaining wall for several years, and they've been noticing that it's been slowly deteriorating. You can see from the picture that the, the top cords on the retaining wall are, are sloughing off. And as, as they got out there and inspected it closer and brought our geotechnical engineers out, they noticed there's also some um, deterioration through the middle and, and bottom portions of the wall also. It, it doesn't have, it's not in, um, it's not gonna have an imminent failure anytime soon. We're not concerned about that, but we do wanna get in and address it before it gets too, too bad. And we, we also get quite a few calls on this from the public, just from the appearance of it. It's, it's not a danger at this point, but it, it does look bad. So our, our maintenance crews, again, they proposed this to be funded through our transportation solutions money, which was a great option because we, we typically don't have funds to go in and, and fix problems like this very easily. We don't have a good funding source for it. Um, well, we've estimated this project to be about 1.4 million and our geotechnical engineers recommended that we install a soil nail wall. I've got a couple pictures here on the right that kind of outline what that looks like. And what's nice about this is we don't have to demolish this, this existing wall. We can leave it in place. And what we'll do is go in and we'll drill through the, the side of that wall into the hillside and place these soil nails. And then on the front of that base, we'll put a new, uh, a new wall system that's tied back into these soil nails. And the old wall can stay in place. And we just put a brand new one in front of it and the, the retaining solution is fixed. This is, uh, again, if we presented it to the commission in the April workshop. So uh, if it's approved and funding is allocated, we would propose this one be built in the summer of 2021 with advertising most likely over the winter of 2020. All right, uh, last, I just wanted to talk about some of the local government efforts in the area. They've, they've been working hard. That, what's nice about Summit County and the Park City area is they are very transportation minded. They're, they're a fun group to work with, we enjoy the partnership that we have with them. And they, they always bring fun projects to the area also. Uh, here's five of them that were run through either federal funding, so UDOT was involved or UDOT actually participated in them. And the one that we wanna highlight here is number four, the Jeremy Ranch Frontage Road Improvement Project. 
you can see it's it's right here at the Jeremy Ranch interchange on I-80. So Summit County proposed this project. They uh, they proposed this for Region Two a few years ago. We we were a little nervous of roundabouts right here at the on and off ramps, but as we started looking into it deeper with them, we got very comfortable with it and actually uh, ended up liking the idea. It, it, it's, it's a very unique way of addressing some of the transportation problems that they've experienced on Homestead Road here. So funding, this is a $13.9 million project. Construction began last summer and it will continue through this summer and it's scheduled to be completed in the fall of 2020. A few things that Region 2 participated in funding, we wanted to help out with the pedestrian crossings through the ramps. You can see this blue line here is a pedestrian trail. And we, we, we wanted to make sure pedestrians could get across the I-80 area safely. And so we, we provided some money to the project so that we could get these under crossings built. Uh, we also were concerned about the wildlife in the area, so we had money added for to upgrade the wildlife fencing and, and add some cattle guards at the ramps to make sure we kept the animals off the freeway. So the project team put together this visualization that I thought would help explain this project a lot better than I would. So we're currently looking at the roundabout on the north side of I-80. We're looking west right now. If anyone's familiar with the area, this gas station is the Phillips 66, the Jeremy store. Now we're looking south down Homestead Road. If you look over on the left, there's an elementary school right there. You can see, see at the top of your screen on the left, the under crossing for the pedestrian path underneath the off ramp, the westbound off ramp. Now we're moving over to the south side of the road, the roundabout there with the eastbound off-ramp coming into the roundabout. And up at the top, you can see the, uh, the shopping center there that drives a lot of traffic also. So UDOT will be responsible for maintaining the ramps down to the roundabout, but the county will maintain the roundabouts themselves and the cross street under I-80. So not much changes as far as uh, jurisdictional maintenance. And then just a, a few interesting points. UDOT, or the county, contributed $10 million to this project. UDOT contributed 2.3, and then the Joint Highway Committee also added uh, just over a million dollars to this project. So just to sum up, uh, UDOT has been, has spent, UDOT and the Local governments have spent about $123 million in the county over the past five years or from 2018 to 2022, which is pretty pretty good amount of money for the population of 40,000 in the area. Uh, with that, that, that concludes our area update for projects. Does, does anyone have any questions on any of those? Mr. Chairman. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, Lou Kramer, Brad, excellent pr presentation. You're right. Summit County is a special place. Lots of tourism, as we know, and other things. May I just ask, I, I think the new project, the roundabout looks interesting. Is that becoming more and more popular in Utah and the country to do roundabouts? Because I wonder if it's as safe as other things. Because I, I've seen some confused drivers trying to figure out which exit to go to. Just a, It's just a general question about roundabouts. Yeah, they, they seem to be getting more popular. I know our traffic and safety group, Robert Miles group, has been looking into them pretty thoroughly over the last few months. They, they, uh, they definitely don't apply everywhere. They've got their points of application that, that they're good at. And, and we're still learning about that at UDOT, but they, they're definitely getting more popular. And it, in the right application, they are a lot safer than traditional uh, intersection methods such as signals and things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question from Brad? Thank you, Region 2. One
Well, so, Mr. Chairman, we, we were going to hear from Grant yes. right there. Oh. Thanks. Uh, I'm Grant Farnsworth, the Region 2 Planning Manager. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to discuss some of the studies going on in Summit County. Uh, these first three I'll be going over in greater detail, and the, the remaining studies I just wanted to show here just to show the collaboration coordination going on between Park City and, and Summit County. Um, the first study, let me change it. Thanks. Is a Kimball Junction and SR 224 area study. Uh, this is looking at the Kimball Junction interchange um, and also the two accurate intersections um, just south of there, uh, looking at capacity transportation solutions. It's jointly funded by Summit County and, and UDOT with a large amount coming from contingency and should be completed in November of 2020. Uh, next one. The, uh, the reason it got started principally was the delay that's occurring in the winter weekdays and, and also other times of the year, but that's when we're uh, analyzing currently and we see a typically a mile of queuing and additional five minutes of delay stretching from I-80. One thing that's kind of unique is in, whereas in the Cottonwoods it's um, usually the weekends that are congested in this area, or at least in this part of Summit County, it's the weekdays. Um, so that's something that was unique and an also thing that we're considering is the development um, sensitivities where the Kimball Junction Tech Center development that's under review by Summit County we're doing sensitivity tests testing it and watching that so we can have a robust study. Um, next slide. So another thing um, that has been critical is just coordinating with Summit County where they helped us scope it make sure that we're on the same um, uh, understanding of their values and um, kind of something that's interesting it's really hard to see in those the picture on the right but in those circles are actually cross-country skiers uh, that when we were flying a drone um, of the to look at the view vehicle queuing it was interesting to see that so just unique things along the corridor uh, we're also a pilot study for the FHWA health framework and uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, pre-NEPA work so this planning and environmental linkages uh, process will help us to not have to do rework uh, when we go into the environmental uh, stage uh, later on. Next slide. So the next study is the SR224 wildlife crossing study that's also jointly funded with Park City and, and UDOT using contingency funding. Um, this builds on mitigation deployments that have already been coordinated with Park City and Summit County, such as a variable message signboard or uh, lowering the speed limit. And what's really valuable is our interaction with our stakeholders. Uh, the Department of Natural Resources is collaring animals to track their movements. And this will be a critical uh, data set to really understand if the treatments that we're looking at, if they'll be effective um, and have that confidence that they will be. So that's, that will be really um, interesting to see that. Next slide. And then this last uh, study I wanted to review um, was brought up during the previous commission at public comment and was also addressed um, yesterday in the workshop, uh, but I wanted to go into a little bit further detail. I, I think the um, question was asked about the uh, cost per rider. So I just wanted to give a few, I'm gonna give you three numbers. Um, looking at a 30 year analysis, um, their uh, cost per rider, um, is seven dollars and fifty nine cents if you look at capitals and operations. If you look at just the operations, uh, it's four dollars and eighty eight cents. And then if you just look at the state investment, it's a uh, fourteen cents per rider. Um, and that just comes because Summit County and FHWA, if they get the build grant, would be paying for the rest of the operations. So uh, I don't remember who asked the question, but hopefully that provides you a, an answer. Um, but yeah, there will be the project is to be widening um, SR 224 in each direction. Um, so they'll, they'll be 12 feet in each direction and we're uh, gathering the right of way for that. Um, another question was about 66 million going down to 50.3 and that was partially uh, answered yesterday. I just want to give a few more details of uh, coordinating with Summit County. They were saying a large part of that was at the alternatives analysis. They looked at some of their assumptions and Part of the segment, it was looked at uh, the cost per mile in an urban area, and a large part of the segment is in a rural area, so uh, that changed their cost. Um, they also reduced some of the amenities at the bus stations. 
and that allowed them to be able to add other lines into the dedicated bus lane. And um, also these numbers will continue to be refined as they go into the environmental step. Uh, so next slide. Uh, the top uh, graphic shows the additional right of way uh, or and pavement required for the bus dedicated lane. But you can see there's a number for the daily riders and the peak rider, rider or days, it surges quite a bit. So this is really critical for their operations with the ski days, um, Sundance and special events that they have going in there. And um, they try to utilize uh, this transit system with frequent headways, they subsidize it so there's no fare. And in January, they had 100,000 riders on their uh, line. Uh, so that are their, uh, it's the end of my presentation. Are there any other questions? Well, good job. Brian, you have something to say too? <laughs> I don't. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> All uh, right. This is Wayne. I, I have a question. The electric bus uh, I assume that has rechargeable batteries, and the batteries would be recharged when the <clears throat> bus is at the terminal. Uh, could you elaborate a little on that? Uh, yeah, so the it is an electric express, and they do have a transit center at Kimball Junction area uh, where they do have charging stations. There's also another one um, closer to the historic uh, Tap Main. Street, which I think also has the charging stations. Thank you. Any other question from Region 2? Thank you, Region 2. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item number three in our agenda is a Federal Highways Administration report and Ivan Morero, I think he's going to entertain us for a few minutes. Yeah, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, good I'm morning. Ivan with the uh, Federal Highway Administration and I just really have one item to bring to the Commission's attention uh, this morning. Um, Ivan, if you would... Okay, I do have a presentation. Is that up? Can everybody see the presentation? Not yet. Okay. Well, while Ivan, uh, while Ivan gets Ivan's presentation up, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. There you go. You can proceed. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Ivan. Uh, you can just go to the second one. Now. All I need to re what I wanted to report today is that we're we're in the process of updating our memorandum of understanding for categorical exclusions. This is something we do every three years and. Uh, uh, just a, as as a background, we, we have two two memorandums of, of understandings uh, that have uh, actually that were should be assigned, not delegated uh, uh, responsibilities to to Utah. So uh, we have the one on categorical exclusions or, or CEs under Section three twenty six of U.S. Code, and then we have uh, the second one under uh, the uh, uh, Section three twenty seven, which covers the uh, environmental assessments, environmental impact statements. So. Um, the uh, the one on CE is the one that we're in the process of updating. Uh, the one on section uh, three twenty six. So um, this one um, it was originally um, executed back in two thousand and eight. So and we've been updating it every three years. We have updates in 2011, 2014, and, and twenty eleven, twenty fourteen, and twenty seventeen. So it's it's time to uh, update it. Um, this uh, particular uh, MOU or assignment allows you that to basically assume authority for and responsibility for the environmental documents as they deal with the uh, categorical exclusion. So basically you that can determine whether or not the action they're taking falls under the uh, categorical exclusion um, uh, definition. Uh, the only exception really is with uh, government to government consultation with uh, federally recognized Indian tribes. That is something that we, we still, uh, uh, Federal Highway still remains uh, involved in that, right? still has responsibility for that. What, what happens is we normally kind of uh, coordinate with you that and, and reach out to the tribes and, and get their their feedback and involvement in the uh, particular action that we're taking. So um, let me see. Let's go to the next one, Ivan. So uh, just uh, 
to bring to your attention, we did make one change to the uh, to this MOU, and it has to do with uh, what happens when we have a a an FR, a federal transit or federal rail uh, project, and uh, it looks like I put transit in both of them. So basically, federal transit and federal rail uh, project that has uh, that could that falls under the definition of a highway project. In those cases, uh, we've included language uh, in the MOU that would allow you that to consult with the uh, either FTA or FRA, depending on the project, and then get their concurrence to go ahead and make the uh, categorical exclusion determination. So it's that's something new that we added to the to the MOU. It's something that you that pushed for and uh, and twisted our arm and eventually convinced us to go ahead and uh, and put this in there. So. Um, that's just the one big that's the only really big change this this uh memorandum of understanding will go to the uh will be the way it was published on the federal register on may 20th it is out there for a 30-day common period so around june 19th uh, uh that period will end and we will at that time uh, take a look at the comments if any and uh decide whether or not we want to execute the new mou at which time uh, carlos and i will have to get nicely dressed up and uh and have a photo up signing the MOU. So uh, that is uh, all I have for you today. I'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have on this. You do such a beautiful job. Nobody has a question. Thank you. All right, then. And yeah, it's been kind of slow on our end over here. Not much to talk about. So, uh, uh, you know, with uh, everything that's going on, things are kind of slow on the, on the federal side. So. Uh, but if, yep, we're, uh, thank you for your time then. Thank you, my friend. Have a wonderful weekend. You too. Okay, item number four is Utah UDOT scoreboard. And I think uh, Chris Peterson and Rob White will be presenting that item. Yes, good morning, commissioners. Um, good morning. This I am presenting from sunny Kaysville, Utah today. Hey. <laughs> this is the third time. It's it's amazing how fast times fly. This is the third time that we've we've had the virtual commission meeting, and it's a little uh, it's uh, sad that I'm getting so comfortable doing it this way. So I, I don't know about everybody else, but I don't have any shoes on today. I just have <laughs> socks. It's kind of nice being able to do that. Um, Carlos, I'm sure, is in his office and wearing shoes. So. Uh, anyway, um, I will, Ivan, I'm going to present today. I think it'll be a little um, easier for me to do that and and advance the slides instead of having to have you do that. So let me just present that right now. All right, I think everybody should be able to see the uh, dashboard. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so currently right now we have two projects that will advertise within the next 60 days. And I, I, that's a sign of the time of year where we have gotten the majority of our program out and advertised and out to the contractors. Um, but what you'll notice here from the center um, graph, center number 110, we are, our, our teams are already lining up and getting ready to put our projects out for next year. And you, that's what this 110 represents is our, our projects that we are preparing for construction in 2021. Um, we do have 10 projects past due that we're working to resolve the issues related to them. Um, so far right now, or at currently active 659 projects that the commission has approved for us to work on. Um, our, we have a goal of 85% of our projects advertised on time. We're 89%, we're continuing on that trend. We're pleased about that. We'd rather be 100, but we understand that there are always a few challenges that we encounter. Since July of last year, we've advertised 130 projects for just over $1.6 billion. Um, during this past month, we have advertised 20 projects um, right around that uh, $900 million range. So a great, great month. I, the, the one project I'll scroll up so everybody can see it is this West Davis corridor project is 800 million and that's the lion's share of, of uh, that number. Uh, we're all excited to see that project finally coming out to the contracting community. Um, this chart right here uh, is a graphical representation of which projects we've advertised and when. And uh, if you can see that we've, we've come through the peak November 
December, March, April, May. And uh, we're now in the low, like I talked, and uh, we're slowing down. But as we prepare this 110, as are these blue ones sitting out here, one thing I want to point out this month is that you'll notice that these green bars out here, November, October, September, August, even June, those are projects that we've advertised ahead of our schedule. And so we had anticipated, um, committed to advertising them no later than October, November, but we're ahead of schedule on these projects. And so uh, we always uh, find that opportunity and our teams are able to take advantage of uh, efficiencies that they find. Um, they'll, they'll advertise those early if it's appropriate. So we're all, I want to point that out because we always talk that we have some late ones and I wanted to point out this month that we also have uh, early ones or, or some that are ahead of schedule. We're, we're happy about that. Um, currently right now we have 180 contracts that are active with in the contracting community and that total is just over $2.2 billion. Um, one point one one billion dollars for those uh, that we've already paid out on those contracts and we still have remaining just just over 1.1 billion uh, left to pay out on those contracts so we're, we're pleased about how uh, those projects are moving forward and I just wanted to point out that uh, despite covid we continue to move forward on those projects um, our our payments during them so far this month, uh, to the contractors, have been over $39 million to our contractors. Last month, they were 59. We still have, uh, well, I guess, a third of the month left. So I expect our May total will, will exceed the $60 million that we paid last month. And if you look back to last year, um, almost every single month, in fact, every month, uh, is over what we had paid out in, in the previous year. So. Um, the uh, UDOT machine continues to roll forward um, effectively and efficiently despite COVID. And we're grateful that we have a great contracting community that can help us uh, take care of our infrastructure and deliver our projects. So with that said, um, that is what I have for the presentation today. Um, are there any questions that anyone may have? I have a question, Nadi. Go ahead, please. Commissioner Gochner, I just was, uh, I wanted to just, to just elaborate a little bit more on the COVID-19 impact on the engineering construction industry. I know a lot of uh, national engineering firms react to what's going on in their state and they furlough or they, you know, sort of shut down. And our state has been remarkably uh, well managed during this time and have been able to stay more uh, engaged with the economy. So I just wanted to hear a little bit more elaboration. Have we seen any uh, impacts from other states and their decisions on our construction and engineering community? You know, I don't think that we have seen um, impacts because of decisions that other states have made. Everyone is watching closely, particularly Pennsylvania shut down all of their construction. Washington did likewise, and uh, even California slowed down some of their work. However, we haven't seen an impact on us because of that. I would point out that we have seen some impacts because of COVID. We have had some contractors who have had some positive test results on their, con on their projects. We have had some contractors who have had symptoms that have appeared to be COVID, and so they have ceased the operations for a short period of time. And so we have had impacts. Um, until they have been able to uh, isolate uh, through tracing who those individuals were and who may have come into contact. But they, uh, but by and large, uh, we've only seen minor delays. We've had a project of two weeks here, a different project of maybe uh, two weeks or three days. But fortunately, by and large, our community, they've been able to be smart and be safe and use the precautions like were laid out in Utah Leads Together to keep our keep our employees and our contractors and employees safe. So hopefully that was adequate. Yes. Thank you. Welcome. Any other question from Chris? Thank you. Marvelous job. Thank you. Good morning, Rob. Good morning. How are you today? 
Wonderful, thank you. Mr. Commissioner, Chair, um, Chair, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, uh, it's good to be with you today. Um, coming to you from West Jordan today um, in my basement office. Uh, happy to be here today. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the zero fatalities goals that we have. It's been an interesting time over these past three months to look at their traffic numbers and their crashes and fatalities. Um, uh, our crashes, of, of course, are down. Uh, our, our traffic overall is down about currently about 12% over the same period last year. And uh, we are uh, looking at uh, some, uh, some numbers as far as fatalities where fatalities really haven't, haven't gone down. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up the graphs that we can look at here and see how we're doing. Hopefully you can all see these. So currently our safety index, our zero fatalities measure is about 84.2%, um, with down a little bit from our from last uh, month when I presented on this. And if you look over there at the six different uh, factors that go into that, um, our traffic fatalities, uh, our ser traffic serious injuries, crashes, internal fatalities, internal injuries and internal equipment damage. And we're getting 100% uh, of our, our score on three of those and 0% on the internal equipment damage and uh, a, a, a portion of, of our score on fatalities and serious injuries. So let's talk about fatalities. It's been kind of a, a, bad, a bad few weeks uh, for fatalities. and. I'm not sure we can, you can speculate on the cause. Uh, we, we see speed increased uh, in, in the lower traffic and people are traveling faster on our roadways and that could be part of the issue. So a crash that would have been survivable before it turns into a fatality because of speed. Um, but overall, we're looking currently about 87 fatalities, which is four over our target uh, for, for this time of year. Uh, that's that's the latest we have. One thing I did want to talk about concerning fatalities is that we've had a several wrong way driving fatalities over the past uh, well this this year, and some of them you know, there's been some on I-80, some on 215, uh, one on I-15 down in Utah County just uh, this week. And uh, one of the things that we're trying to do with with this uh, to to prevent those is detection. We have a project out there where we've put 30 infrared cameras, well, they're not, sorry, not infrared, uh, thermal cameras at the uh, on-ramps to detect and warn the traffic operations center when we get a wrong way driver. A large percentage of these folks will turn around before they, uh, before they call it, get on the freeway and cause a crash. And uh, we've, we've seen that time and time again as we've put these cameras up. And we only have 30 of them. We've tried to target high impact areas where we believe that there will be um, drivers getting on the wrong direction. That's one of the things we've done. One of the other things we've done is those uh, wrong way, do not enter signs that you see. We've, we've enhanced those and in some cases put flashing ones so that if you get directed the wrong way, there'll be red flashing lights that, that, that tell the driver to turn around. Um, some other states have done things such as uh, warn oncoming drivers of wrong way dri drivers uh, through the uh, through uh, overhead signs. Uh, that's something that Arizona has done with those uh, th with their system, and we're we're looking at, at a system like that as well. But uh, that's a, a concern we've had for for a couple of years, and, and we're looking at ways to try to prevent and try to warn and try to minimize the impact of of those wrong way crashes. So our suspected serious injuries, uh, we currently have, uh, we're, and, and again, a reminder that these are have about a three month lag in them. Uh, we don't track them quite as uh, as closely. We don't get the reports back from from the the uh, responders, and so this is this has about a two to three month lag in it. So we currently have 162 actual serious injuries, and we that's uh, off of our target by by 13. Internally, we uh, currently are at uh, our injury rate per 200,000 working hours is 2.19, 2 so we're below our target on that one. So this is the good news. 
our traffic crashes overall are down and we're, we're actually below our target on our, on our crashes. Um, some of this, uh, I, I think in the last month or so, you could attribute this to the lower uh, traffic volumes. However, so we're looking at about a three month lag. So that really hasn't started hitting yet, but even so we're, we're ahead of our target in, in this particular area. And I see this only um, getting better for the next three months as our, our traffic volumes go down. Um, our equipment damage internally seems to be a struggle, a, a continual struggle with, with, our, with our folks. And this is something that, that our safety group I know is working on, trying to get folks to uh, uh, be more careful with our equipment, uh, things like, and, and, and you see those two peaks there, and that's, that's been pretty typical in the winter months where we have a lot more snow plows out on the roads and pulling in and they're working a lot of hours and, and uh, do things like uh, typically, you know, run into the, the, the door to, for, the, for the shop or uh, just usually these are, these are fairly minor incidents, but uh, uh, add up to a, a fair amount of, of money. And so this is something we're going to continue to target and make sure that our folks are being as safe as possible. Obviously, uh, injury is, is more important, but uh, equipment damage also important and something we're going to continue to track. Um, I don't have anything else to report. Oh, actually I do. And I don't know. Let's go back to, I wanted to show you one more thing before I move off. And this is something that I, I reported on in January and I believe in February as well. Uh, we want to start looking at what our fatality rate is per 100 million miles traveled. That's kind of the benchmark that we use and is used across the country. And so I'm going to pull you into this other dashboard. And if you saw how I got in there, I can go back real quick and show you that. And so it's, it's it, this is our strategic direction page, and it has all of our strategic goals. And then down below is some tactical measures um, in uh, traffic and safety. And then uh, there's several other measures and you can look at some of the same ones that we just looked at on a more regional or a, a basis. But the one I wanted to really focus on this morning was this one, our, uh, our fatality rate per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. And like I said, this is the benchmark. And if you look at this over the past um, five years and the data for 2020 is not up to date, so I would just ignore that for now, but look at, look at the, where we've been over the last five years and uh, we're down to 0 0.75 uh, fatality per 100 million mile travel. Now that's a great number. Uh, it's going in the right direction. We appreciate that. We realize we still have a long way to go. I, I think the thing that uh, just a, just for comparison, nationally, our rate is about 1.1 to 1.2. The last uh, the last uh, overall uh, nationwide uh, look at this that I saw. So I, I think in Utah, we're doing a, a very good job uh, and I would congratulate our, our zero fatalities partners um, and also uh, the, the public in general for for driving safe and, and especially wearing seatbelts. I, I think that's one thing you can point to that has uh, decreased this number over the years is the, the uh, folks out there actually buckling up. And many, we just had our fatality review meeting this week uh, where we reviewed all the fatalities for the first quarter of 2020. And um, very, very many of those had uh, fatalities were people that were thrown from the vehicle uh, because they were not wearing their seatbelt. And so I, I, I think that's just a reminder for all of us to uh, that's one thing that we can do that's very simple to do every day every time we get into the car so with that challenge i will leave and, and and i'm open to any questions any questions from rob don't be shy uh mr chair if please. i might go ahead um, please. i just i've i found that particularly watching the news and and paying attention to the to uh, the fatalities, I've come to take them as personally as uh, UDOT does um, in my role. I've, I have noticed that the news agencies uh, report when people aren't uh, seat belted. And I hope that that's something that was intentional on the part of UDOT to communicate so that we can help um, 
alleviate those mistakes that lead to those fatalities. So I just wanted to congratulate you on efforts and appreciate all that, that you do. Thank you, Commissioner Long. Uh, Commissioner Van Tassel, I have a question. On the wrong way driving, do you have a breakdown on how many of those are impaired? About about fifty percent of those that uh, get on are, are are impaired, and about another twenty five percent have either a medical condition or um, are in the uh, uh, elderly category. Um, and so there's there's it, it's kind of that's something we've started looking at over the past several years. Is is you know what are the what are why are people getting on the, the wrong direction and. And I think, you know, it's it's obviously impairment is is a big one, uh, and and we're trying to structure our our media and our education campaigns around um, making obviously you know don't drink and drive has been a campaign for many many years, but uh, we're we're trying to to ta tailor those to to make sure that people understand them, and you know that's the education is one piece and. And the the uh, trying to make systems on a roadway, trying to make those those uh, roadways safer as well by by the cameras that I mentioned earlier, and also the signing. So, well, thank you for your work. It was a good report. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you, Rob. Have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy the Memorial Weekend. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, item number five is a public comment section of our agenda. And we will have, uh, I think we have Summit County would like to present. And then we will ask Eileen Barron to do summarize the, all the comments that she has received. Do we have someone from the Summit County? Is that Commissioner Robinson? Go ahead, please. Good morning and thank morning. you all. Can you hear me all right? Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you. We, Introduce we, yourself and your position, please. Yeah. I'm Christopher Robinson. I'm in my 12th year as a member of the Summit County Council. And uh, I'm here to talk about our request for TTIF funds for this uh, BRT project on SR224, which is our main artery into Park City from I-80. And I, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, First of all, we've had a great relationship with Region 2 and with UDOT in general, and we appreciate uh, the creation of the planning position in each region that has really helped enhance that relationship. Um, we also think that this uh, build grant, we've been very highly encouraged that this is our year to get it and that we feel like with uh, this reduced request of the TTIF funds down to 2.5 million, that it'll show strong support and will bring significant uh, federal dollars to the state. And uh, I don't know how much you all know about our county, but uh, it's now become both summer and winter, and it's not just on big snow days or during Sundance or during other things, but uh, SR224, is is bottlenecked and we have uh, an excellent transit system and we have uh, taken adv availed ourselves of all of the uh, legislative legislature approved sales taxes and other things for transit and transportation to give us the necessary tools so um we're strongly committed to this we will use those tools to to provide the local match and this money from the TTIF would be very, very valuable in, in not only in, in the great support we've already received from UDOT verbally and in letters and things, but, but showing some skin in the game. And so uh, we think that, uh, you know, Park City and Summit County provide a lot of economic development to the state and, and this just increases our competitiveness. And uh, I'd entertain any questions that you might have, but uh, we we hope that you'll see that this is a valuable project. Any question from Councilman Robinson? This is uh, Commissioner Gochner-Nagy. Go ahead, please. I just want to uh, 
put a big underline under the statement that Summit County provides a lot of economic uh, strength to our state. And, um, I think it's important that uh, we invest there. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Mr. Chairman? Please. Go ahead, um, if I may, if I may add, um, at the request of the commissioners during our meeting yesterday, we prepared an, an alternative motion for you when it comes to item 7A6 on the agenda, which is the Transit Transportation Investment Fund project list. So we have a motion currently in your materials based on the list we presented last month, but we have also provided you an alternative motion that would allow you to include this project if you wanted to. So you'll, you, you should have um, that, it should be available to all the commissioners that alternative motion. So that will be up to you guys at that point, which motion you'd like to use. Yes, we do have that. Thank you, Terry. Mr. Chair, could I mention one other thing, please? Yes, go ahead, please. Um, we are asking for these funds contingent upon our being awarded the build grant. So uh, no funds would be expended by the state unless we get the rest of the federal grant. Thank you for that clarification. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Robinson? Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Have a wonderful weekend. You too, thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Eileen, you have the con. All right. Good morning, commissioners. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. All right. Well, my name is Eileen Barron. I'm communications manager for our planning and investment group, and I've been asked to report on our public comments. Um, we received 189 comments on two topics. And because of that volume of comments on a similar topic, I'm presenting a summary of those comments. And then there was one additional topic that I'll uh, present that comment in its entirety. Um, Ivan, will you go ahead and share the screen for the May 2020 public comments received, please? And I'll just mention that this comment document with a link to all of the um, comment content uh, is available on the Transportation Commission page. We just posted this last night. Um, so Ivan's showing you where that is located so that um, if you want to go back and see the summary, or as I said, at the top of this summary, um, I've provided a link to all the um, complete contents of the comments. So with that, I'm going to uh, present the summary that I've prepared of the comments received. And first, the, the first topic are comments regarding the proposed Provo River Trail extension. And as I mentioned, the complete list of comments received on this topic are available on a Google Sheet um, with the link provided there uh, with the complete contents of the emails received. So 187 comments were received expressing support for funding the proposed three mile extension of the Provo River Trail. And one comment expressed that the project should be deferred due to financial uncertainty related to the coronavirus pandemic. The people who emailed comments of support identified themselves as trail users who were enthusiastic about making the connection between Wasatch and Utah counties for commuting and recreation purposes. Many stated concern for the safety of bicyclists who ride on US 189 where there is no trail. Every comment was unique, which means 187 people took the time to put their thoughts into writing to show their support for the proposed trail project. Based on this set of comments, people of all ages and abilities use the Provo River Trail, including seniors over 70, families with young children, college age adults, and adaptive sports organizations and rehabilitation centers. People who use the trail come from a variety of backgrounds, including educators, physicians, realtors, animators, scouts, historians, scientists, accountants, engineers, technology specialists, marketing professionals, morticians, and athletes. 
A few items to note, we had two local government representatives submitted their support, including a planner from Wasatch County and a Provo City Councilwoman. Many of these commenters described year round use and weekly to daily use of the existing trail. Several described health and wellness benefits of using the trail for commuting and several described the long term benefits to the community. I want to provide a few examples and excerpts of the comments received. To whom it may concern, I am writing this email in support of the funding for the Provo Canyon Trail from Vivian Park to the Deer Creek Dam. This trail is supported by the County Trails Master Plan, and I am sure that the growing number of residents in both valleys would utilize the new trail heavily. Thank you for your consideration of funding for this important segment of trail that will connect the Heber Valley with the many trail options in Utah County. Sincerely, Doug Smith, Wasatch County Planning Department from Heber, Utah. Next example, to whom it may concern, I completely support the expansion of trails and trail networks in our state. They add to quality of life and provide a means of mobility and recreation. I hope the Provo River Trail system will be a top priority this year for your commission. Sincerely, Shannon Ellsworth, Provo City Council, District 3. Next example, I am asking for your support to approve the final segment of the Provo River Trail. This trail is an important transportation element for a large community of bikers, hikers, and runners. This provides a corridor of travel that supports clean air and physical well being while reducing vehicle traffic. Best, Jess Adamson. To whom it may concern. Finishing the trail between Vivian Park and Deer Creek is an awesome idea. The trail is loved and well used and would enable more people to use it on longer rides. I am all for keeping cyclists off the road on this stretch of highway. Right now it's unavoidable to get to certain destinations and it's scary because of the cars as well as the debris on the shoulders. Just the wind and dust kicked up from passing motorists is hard to deal with. Please finish the stretch. Karen Zimbelman, wife, mother, grandmother, longtime Provo resident and avid cyclist. As enthusiastic cyclists, my family and I fully support getting the funding to complete this trail. Bicycle travel is so important for the future of Utah, our climate and our health. We would encourage you to do whatever you can to fill this critical gap in our transportation infrastructure. Thanks, Josh Budikofer. One of the emails included three photos that I have shared in the summary. They came from Isaac Hale, um, who wrote in part, I am an Orem resident and I bike the entirety of the Provo Canyon Parkway Trail at least twice a week. Biking from my home up the canyon is always a treat and to have more pavement to ride on would only enhance an already wonderful part of our community. The trail is often pretty popular, especially on the weekends. And I think the addition would increase enjoyment and also help to spread the crowds a bit more on more heavily trafficked days. From Isaac Hell. Within the 187 comments um, that were all expressing support for funding this proposed project, there were some other topics that I want to acknowledge. Widen American Fort Canyon to improve safety for bicyclists, improve safety for bicyclists at the Sundance turnoff connection to Alpine Loop. There was request for more bicycle paths in Springville, request to consider paving the rail trail from Park City to Wanship, as well as a paved path along I-80 from Park City to Salt Lake City. Support for expansion of biking and running paths throughout the state. Would love to see more trails, including a safe way to bike between Mapleton and Provo. Replace the Heber Valley Bridge for safety of kayakers and tubers using the river. Sign and stripe the trail to provide added safety for cyclists and pedestrians. Request for soft surface such as dirt, wood chips, or gravel for trail. Request for deep gravel base for improved asphalt smoothness of trail. Likes protected bike lanes in Provo and adjusts their route to use them. Safety concern using Geneva Road where the bike lane cuts out around 
2000 North Provo and bicyclists have to ride in traffic and defer projects like these until Utah's financial challenges resulting from the coronavirus are resolved. Chair, do you have any questions or comments um, before I move on to the second topic? Uh, I have just the one comment. Impressive with all the results of the 187 comments. What are morticians doing in that trail? Are they looking for business? No, I think, um, you know, I picked up those sort of background factors from email addresses and how they, uh, and signature lines. And uh, just wanted to share with you today the range of um, different populations and uh, different user groups. And so, um, you know, mentioning that particular profession is just a way of indicating that people of all walks of life um, are expressing the value they find uh, yeah. in the trail. Well, I don't blame them. There's a beautiful trail and yes. Any question from the commission? Proceed, please. Okay, and our last comment today is regarding SR224 access to Wasatch County from Park City. Commissioners, good morning. I am following up on the presentation I made to you on January 24th in Riverton regarding the southernmost mile of SR224 that starts at the seasonal gate located above the Montage Hotel and extends to the Wasatch County line. The seasonal gate was opened this past Monday, which means the volume of traffic up and down the road will be seeing a dramatic increase in coming weeks and continue until it closes in early November. This road section is one mile long and is only 15 feet, four inches wide at its narrowest point. There are no guardrails and an 80 foot death drop off the west side of the road onto the newer Twisted Branch Road that was built to Utah standards and intended to replace the current substandard road. This road section is now a commuter road for workers and also tourists coming into Park City from the Heber Valley and from Big Cottonwood Canyon. There is constant dump truck usage on the road from construction companies, which is unsuitable for such a narrow road. This road section has dramatically increased volume over the past 20 years because of the well-known problems with SR248 from I-40 into Park City and growth in general. Additionally, Park City purchased the Bonanza flat property a few years back and has since installed four sets of bathrooms and parking areas on that property, which has resulted in increased recreational traffic up and down the road. I am urging the commission to take action to abandon this road section and put the public on the new road before there is a fatality. As I understand it, public safety is a sacred duty of all government functions. Please take me seriously. I am a 61 year old father of four children and I am sharing legitimate concerns with you. I will make myself available to any of you as requested. An on site visit would be very eye opening and possibly quite shocking to each of you. Last season, there was an average of over 1,700 trips made up and down this road on a daily basis. This unsafe situation must be remedied as soon as possible. I would like to remind you that Deer Valley Ski Resort does not have a UDOT permit to ski across SR224 in the winter time, bandana ski run. So this is another reason this matter needs to be resolved. Respectfully submitted, Mark J. Fisher. And Chairman, that concludes the public comments. Let me just check the inbox to see if anything has come in while I was reading. Okay. And I see nothing new has uh, been entered. Uh, Carlos, would you please comment on the last paragraph of that statement that they don't have any permit, you do not permit to ski? What does that mean? Well, we, this goes this this issue has been around for over 30 years and um maybe if brian is still on the phone he can he can jump in on this one um, because i don't believe we own the right of way actually where the road where our road is on okay. brian yes yes so, so 
Ooh. Wow, you have a lot of authority. Yeah, so, like Carlos mentioned, we've we've uh, this has been an issue for for thirty plus plus years. We've we've tried to work with the number of entities up up that canyon. Uh, there's there's uh, there's cabins up on top. Uh, there's the montage uh, development halfway up. Uh, this has always been a seasonal road, and as soon as as soon as the weather turns, we've clo we close the gates, just because we know how unsafe the road is. Road is uh, the comment about switching over to this uh, road that's called Twisted Branch Road is in th that is a private road. Uh, we don't feel like we have the authority to do that. Uh, that was put in by uh, the group that uh, owns the montage up there and is a, is a private private facility. We have limited right away uh, with our with our roadway, and uh, there's so there's not a lot a lot we can do with our with our section, uh, and also just the the number of, of vehicles or the travelers that use it you know it, it would be hard to justify doing much improvement there okay right Brian, uh the the chairman asked the question relative to that the skiers are skiing across the right away without a permit do you have a comment on that yes so so we have uh, when the when that roadway was built, the Twisted Branch Road, that private entity came in and and got permits from UDOT to to build that road. And part of that, because this road has uh, is really has really close proximity to the road that we own, and part of, part of that permit or part of that transaction uh, allowed them to uh run their ski skiers over our section uh when that road was closed we have reviewed that with all of our legal counsel and and feel like that they do have a permit to do that and they're doing nothing wrong okay thank you brian so in order to help the community then what needs to be done they request an abandoning the road and switching to the new road. So what do we need to do as a commission to help you as a UDOT and you help the community to resolve this? So, so commissioner, one, one of the, the really the problem that we have uh, dealing with this situation is that there's so many different entities up there and they don't all share the same vision of what that road should, should uh, look like. Okay. There's, there's folks up on the top that adamantly want that rose closed in the winter and very limited access. Uh, we have a you know private development up there that doesn't want to see anything done with the existing road, uh, as well as Park City uh, has concerns with allowing more access up onto the top. So it's there's multiple. Uh, entities up there and, and all of them, them don't share the same vision and goal of what that road should be. Thank you for that explanation. Any other commissioners have a question, comments? Go ahead, Donna, please. Uh, just a comment, Eileen, what a wonderful job you did sorting through those uh, 187 comments and trying to create a succinct communication for us. Um, I appreciate the work that you do. Thank you for saying Yes. Thank you. Yes. See none then. Thank you, Eileen. Have a wonderful weekend. And you did a fantastic job, girl. Now you have a beautiful voice and you know how to read. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. You take care of yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Next item of agenda is number six consent agenda. I think Ivan. Harden is going to be giving some presentation and then we will ask for motion from the commission to approve the minutes and item next item about that. Go ahead, please. 
So on the screen now is um, agenda item number six, which is the consent agenda. Items for approval is the approval of the minutes. Included is the STIP Amendment 8, the funding adjustment and award and post construction. These are projects that are either adjusting at the award of a, the construction contract or at the end of the construction contract, and we're getting ready to close the project. There's also a consent agenda item, which is the US 89. It is a project combination where we have two projects, the US 89 4300 South to 3000 South and the US 89 I215 to 4300 South. It will be combining the scope and the funding for this project. Our request. Okay. Go ahead. Our request today is just a mo motion to approve the minutes, the consent agenda, and the items above, listed above. Included on this, uh, this not come down, pull, pull across very well. I'm gonna jump back to our Now that came came across better. Okay, thank you. So that's this one. I just pulled directly from our the meeting minutes agenda. Um, I don't know why Adobe cropped it um, odd to go through, but this is a our the typical experience of reading through the minutes um, from the past month. And at the bottom are our is is the list of the post award and construction adjustments and the consent agenda. Mr. Chair, are you ready for a motion? Yes, please. I move to approve the consent agenda. This is Wayne, I'll second the motion. So there's a motion and a second. Any questions, comments regarding the minutes, corrections? Seeing none, I'm gonna ask for nay vote. Is there any nay vote among you commissioners? Hearing none, I declare that unanimous. Thank you, it's approved. I will proceed, please. Okay. Going well, now to our next item of program development or the 2020 step amendment item number eight. Item 7A1 is a scope change. It's along the Redwood Road project, 4100 South to 5400 South. Again, it's a, a scope only change. There's no funding change. The scope of the Redwood Road 4100 South to 5400 South project is to improve operations and, and safety along the corridor by adding turn pockets, constructing bus pullouts, and improving street lighting along the Redwood Road through Taylorsville City. This project is experiencing higher than estimated costs. In reviewing the project, it was determined that either the project would need additional funding or to reduce scope. Taylorsville City is requesting to remove the scope of constructing the 1780 BRT connector road from the Redwood Road 4100 South and 5400 South project. The BRT connector road will be constructed as a separate city project with city resources. This was approved at the Wasatch Front Regional Council scope change on their April 16th, 2020 meeting. Located here, this is Redwood Road, 5400 South to 4100 South. And you'll notice this blue line section, this is where that BRT connector road um, is located. An exhibit on this one, also I'll come back to the motion in just a second. Um, included in the materials is a letter from Taylorsville City uh, requesting that change and committing to uh, construct that BRT section with city resources. Back to our motion, our request today is a motion for approval to modify the scope of the Redwood Road 4100 South to 5400 South project as detailed. I'll make that I motion. Move. I'll second it. Okay. 
Please state your names. When you state in the motion, state your names also, please, for the record. Thank you. Natalie Gawker, I'll make that motion. Kevin Van Tassel seconded. Okay. Any further questions, comments? Ivan, did we have any commitments from the Taylor City with the timeline on their BRT section? I will, uh, I will punt this one over to Region Two with Brian. This, this okay. is Brad Paul. We we don't have any commitments on a timeline for when they'll build that BRT component. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to rather than call and roll call for eyes, I'm going to ask for nay vote. Is there any nay among your commissioners? No. Here are none. I will declare that as unanimous. Item number 7A-1 is approved. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 7A-2 is the I-15 southbound, 123 south. 123rd South to an SR 201. This is an addition, a funding request addition from the Transportation Investment Fund of $18.5 million. Region two requests adding funding to the I-15 southbound 123rd South to SR 201 project to cover additional costs incurred due to delays experienced by the contractor as they worked with the third party utility providers. Due to these delays, the majority of the delay costs included uh, resequencing of the work, overhead costs to the contractor, and maintaining tra traffic control for an additional 15 months of construction activity. Map located here on I-15 from 123rd South Graper up to the 201 interchange. Our request today is a motion for approval to add funding to the I-15 southbound 123 south to the SR-201 project as detailed. Question, Ivan. Do we have a timeline or time limit for the contractors to have change orders? I'll, I will let Region 2 respond if that's all right. Region two or Chris Peterson, if he's still with us. Go ahead, please. Chris? You want me? Go ahead, Brad. I, or... I, I, Go ahead, Brad. Choose. Yeah, so, so uh, your question on a, on a timeline, uh, Typically, typically by by contract, we try to get them to identify when there's a change in condition up front, so that we have the ability, especially on these larger projects like this, to be part of this part of the solution. Uh, so, so uh, more than uh, most of the time, they end up you know, bringing that to our attention early on, we work through the process on whether we agree with the change or not, potentially adding or changing the scope to help facilitate. And then, you know, uh, eventually uh, agreeing on a price and a time, ex you know, time extension if, if needed. So that's the typical pro process. Uh, this, this one was obviously unique. This was the one that one that we've I brought to your attention, you know, a number of times over the last year, uh, due to the you know the circumstances that we ran in with the with the railroad. <clears throat> Thank any, you. For any that. detailed questions I can answer? Well, ask before Brian checks out. He's gonna go boating somewhere. Please ask the question. <laughs> Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna ask for the nay vote then. Is there any nay among the commissioners on this particular project? Seeing or hearing none, I'm gonna declare that as unanimous vote on item 7-7A-2. Approved, thank you. Thank you. Item 7A, 
Ash 3 is the US 89 Provo Canyon Rock Fall Rent Fence Repair. It's a funding addition of our Transportation Solutions Funds for $175,000. The US 189 Provo Canyon Rock Fall Fence Repair Project will repair the rock fall fence that has been damaged and no longer controls rock fall events from reaching the US 189 travel lanes. Field visits during this design process determined that more rock had accumulated behind the fence and the damage to the mesh drapery was more extensive than originally anticipated. Replacement of the fence and rock cleaning is more extensive than was budgeted. It was expected that the westbound lane would allow for maintenance of traffic. However, with the increased amount and the size of the rock fall to be removed, the westbound lane is not able to be used. This will place both directions of traffic on the eastbound lanes during construction. The increased cost of traffic control is to manage the crossovers from the westbound to the eastbound lanes. So located here on our map, near the mountain range campground. And a picture of our the rockfall fence. And this section here is the drapery, and that's what the drapery looks like, a closer image. You can see the rock fall behind that's accumulated behind the, the drapery. Our request today is a motion for approval to add funds to the US 189 Provo Canyon rock fall fence repair project as detailed. This is Commissioner Evans. I move for approval. Kevin, I'll, I'll second. Okay. I have a motion and a second. Any further questions, concerns, comments? Please state. Seeing none, I'm going to ask for a nay vote among the commission. Seeing no com nay com uh, vote, then I'm going to ask, I'm going for unanimous approval of item 7A 3. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item 7A4 is the Transportation Solutions Proposed Project List Approval. Um, as discussed in the April 2020 STIP Workshop Part 2, the department presented proposed projects for our Transportation Solutions Program. Projects listed in the Transportation Solutions Program will be amended in the current year STIP. As Transportation Solutions is a single year project, this will allow for work to begin on projects when funding is available, current available balance in the program, the July 1 for state transportation funds and October 1st for our federal funds. In our exhibit, we have a link to the STIP project app on the website and under the Transportation Commission website, as well as a list of our transportation solutions projects with their region and associated project values. Shown here. Our request today is a motion for approval for the proposed transportation solutions project list to be used to amend the 2020 to 2024 STIP as detailed. We have gone through this list for the last few months, so we should know by heart what it is. Even some of us memorized all the items. I have my color chart, so uh, <laughs> Donna Law, I. Uh, I move to approve this. Thank this you, item. Donna. Thank you, Donna. Kevin Van Tassel seconds. Thank you, Kevin. Any other further questions, concerns? Uh, maybe just this is Commissioner Evans. Just a question on the next this and the next two categories in general. So, what's uh, have we ever allowed as a commission or you dot if a city? you know, has an agreement where they need something desperately and they, right now, they don't make our cut. Is there ever a way where they can find other ways to fund something through bonds or different things and then work out an agreement to get some reimbursement back towards that? Or once it's done, it's done. What What's the, Carlos or Terry, What what's the, the precedent on things like that? Have we ever done that or is that an option for consideration? Um, I think, I'm, I'm struggling with a, spe a specific example, but I would say- give I'll give an example. I'll give an example, the mountain, the uh, vineyard connector. The vineyard Let's connector. Say the vineyard, you know, they didn't quite make the cut when we're gonna, on one of these lists and 
and then they find a way to say, okay, we're going to go figure out a way to try to temporarily build and fund some of this so we can get this quicker. Uh, is there a way? The question from Mayor, the mayor to me, we had a discussion yesterday. The question was, is there ever a way where we could try to get reimbursement if we can come up with a way to try to get some temporary funds to cover the funding to get something going? The, the, um, you know, we always look for opportunities to try to get these projects done, and we applaud the cities and counties. Um, we've had lots of examples where uh, cities, counties have worked with private developers that have upfronted the money, um, and we've worked out agreements uh, on possible repayments. The problem with a possible repayment is the position we're in, in that we've, the commission has programmed out into 2025. Uh -huh. So we're so far out. So any further commitments are going to be, you know, even pushing that that farther out. We really don't know what the world looks like. And so I think it would put the commission and, uh, you know, honestly, the, the department in a very difficult position on that. Um, but I think what you see is as as the program moves forward, there's constant changes. That's, you know, what you guys manage every month. There's changes to the program. And, uh, you know, the city's looking for $15 million to do this next segment. That's not a, I have to be careful how this comes across, but that's not a large amount of money in the context of the, of the work you do as a commission. And so I would say that as we move forward, the awareness that the commission has about the needs for this project, I think everyone saw the articles probably in the paper about, you know, it's been the fastest growing city in the country for the last 10 years. Um, that it's an important project to that community and there might be opportunities in the future. So sorry to run around the tree like that a couple times on you, Commissioner, but I would say, no. I would never say never is never, um, but we have to be careful to go into it with eyes open. No, I agree. I, I was just a question and I thought I'd raise that in this discussion as we talk about, we're about to prove these projects that are on the list, there's projects that aren't on the list. and. That was a question that came in to me and I thought I'd bring it up. And so it seems like, uh, you know, they would continue to work with the regional directors and raise the awareness and the commission as we go forward, you know, on opportunities. So thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Any other questions from Carlos, Terry, Jason, or Ivan? Seeing none, I'm calling for the vote. Any nay among commissioners? Seeing or hearing none, I declare item 7A-4 unanimous. Approved, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item 7A-5, the Transportation Investment Fund, the proposed project list. Also in the April 2020 STIP workshop, part two, the department presented these proposed projects. Our projects listed on the Transportation Investment Fund will be amended into the current year STIP, the 2020 to 2024. Our exhibit, also the project app, as well as the list of these proposed projects, the, the funding recommendations on these projects. Our request today is a motion for approval of the proposed transportation investment fund project list to be used to amend the 2020 to 2024 STIP as detailed. I'd move for approval. This is Commissioner Evans. We've, like Donna said, we've looked at the colored charts. We've had a chance to review this over several meetings and look at the projects. And so I, I think it's a good list. I move for approval. Thank you. I'll second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussions, questions, comments, concerns? Seeing and hearing none. I'm asking for a nay vote from the commissioners. Anyone? And hearing none, then I will declare item 7A-5 as a unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our next item, item 7A-6, is the Transit Transportation Investment Fund proposed project listing. Again, in the April 2020 STIP workshop, part two, the department presented proposed projects list, project listed in transit transportation invest investment fund program will be amended in the current year STIP. On, on the exhibit of this fact sheet is the link to the projects app and also included is the funding recommendations of the TTIP shown here. 
a request. Mr. Today yes. Is, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. It, our request today is a motion for approval of the proposed transit transportation investment fund project list to be used to amend the 2020 2024 step as detailed. Mr. Chairman, uh, Kevin ahead, Van Tassel, I, uh, I move to approve the T5 funding recommendation as presented and, uh, and the SR224 Kimball Junction to Park City BRT project for 2.5 million contingent, contingent on receiving a federal bill grant to the 2024 step. Thank you, Commissioner. This was the item that the uh, Councilman Robinson presented a few minutes ago and asked and pleaded to for the commission. That is correct. Lou Kramer, I second uh, Commissioner Van Tassel's motion. Thank you. Any questions, comments regarding the motion, amended motion? It is important to understand how we read that motion. If you have a question, please ask now. Seeing none, go ahead, Commissioner Kramer. You have a question? I'm just sign. Okay. Thumbs up. I'm sorry. I don't know where the <laughs> word came from. Thumbs up. Okay. Hearing or seeing no uh, objection on that, then I'm calling for the nay vote among the commissioners. Raise your hand, your eyebrows, or your shoulders someplace that I can see. Seeing none, then I'm going for the motion of the approval unanimously. Seven. A dash six approved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our next item is information only. Seven A seven is the SR one fifty four cast in place barrier project. It's a hundred and sixty thousand dollar transportation solutions project. Region two requested to add the SR one fifty four cast in place barrier project to the current step, just north of one hundred fourteenth South. On northbound Bangor Highway, several vehicles have departed the roadway, crashing into fencing along the backyards of homes adjacent to the highway. To prevent these crashes, cast-in-place barrier will be installed to prevent vehicles from leaving the roadway. Located here on our map, down here is 114th South, just at the very at the bottom of our map, heading north on Bangor Highway. This curve right here. Again, this is from information only. There is no request for a motion. But if there's a question, please ask. Nagi, were, were you looking at my, at my question look? Yes. <laughs> uh, there was a news story earlier this week about barriers. Is there a difference between cast in place and placed barriers? I'll let Region 2 answer. It's in with it being in their region. This is Brad Palmer. Yeah, so there, there are a few different types of barrier systems we can install. One of them being cast in place. Another is where the barrier is manufactured offsite. It's a, called a precast barrier that's just placed at the location. And then many times we'll actually drill it into the pavement to hold it in place if it is impacted. Did that answer your question, Donna? Uh, it did, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Brad. And thank you, Ivan. So are you doing the next item or the Jared is doing the next item? Um, I'll, Jared will present the next item um, and I'll let him direct me if he wants to share his screen or just use this uh, the PDF pulled from the meeting minutes. I think we can use the PDF pulled from the meeting minutes, uh, Ivan. Um, if you'll scroll down, because there's really, it's just, this is informational. Uh, we'll, we'll vote on this. The commission will vote on this um, next month. The, the big draws for the commission that I want to bring your attention to on the five-year ACIP are, are two things. Um, one, the CARES Act, now, uh, as I as I discuss this, this is within the context of the CARES Act gave the FAA money, not the state of Utah money, but it gave the FAA money to fully fund all of the 2020 AIP projects. 
I bring that up. It's, it's post this ACIP, but I bring it up because I wanted you to be aware that that actually saved us $584,000 in state money uh, that we will then forward on into the future ACIP. Um, the other thing I, I would like the commissioner, I want to highlight for the commissioners uh, as they consider the vote next month, the five-year ACIP as currently stands is 192 projects. So there are 192 projects represented for $268 million. And that breaks down to uh, 215 million in federal dollars, which is about 80% of the ACIP, uh, just shy of $10 million. So $9.3 million in state money, which breaks down to 3.5% of the ACIP and uh, $49 million in local sponsor match, which is, represents about 18.4% of the ACIP. So I wanted to highlight those numbers for you um, as you consider the ACIP for, for next month's vote. Uh, there are 49 projects in 2021. Uh, there are 49 projects in 2021, 44 projects in 2022, 40 projects in 2023, 31 projects in 2024, and only 28 projects in 2025. And as we discussed yesterday, um, those obviously as we go year by year, we'll add projects to the ACIP and, and you will approve those each year as well. But that's what I wanted to highlight for you was it's 192 projects, $268 million uh, with a breakdown of 80% Fed, 3.5% state and 18% local. Any questions, Mr. Chairman? Go ahead, please. I was just going to say, Jared, thank you. It's, it's so nice to have that insight into something that we often don't focus much on, but it's so critical. Uh, and appreciate that work. And uh, I had, you know, had no idea some of those places had airstrips, but thanks for keeping good track of them for us. <laughs> yes, sir. Absolutely. My pleasure. Uh, I, enjoyed, I still remember that great tour we had in, uh, was it in Vernal? Uh, driving around on the, I had no idea. What was cooking there? And it's critical for what we're doing here. We're a big state, lots of dirt between airports, and we're grateful for the what what the air traffic can do, even post post virus. So thank you. Even post virus. Well, anytime you want to go drive on a runway, Commissioner, you just let me know. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, With Jared. Or airplanes landing at the same time. <laughs> yes, go ahead, please. Who had a question? Uh, Jared, also, I failed to ask you to introduce you and give you a little bit of bio about the two new commissioners we have. How long you've been with the department, where you came from? Would you please just oh, a absolutely. very brief sure. bio? Uh, real quick, I was previously, I've been here for about three years. I was previously the director of state government affairs for the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, uh, which is the world's largest aviation association. Uh, in that position, I worked with every state and every governor and every DOT um, uh, influencing state aviation policy uh, and improving uh, aviation transportation policy across the country. That's about just, as brief as it gets. Jared, Jared, Jared share, your, share the service you've provided to this country. Yes. Uh, I did seven years in the United States Air Force as a loadmaster on C-17s. I have fought in Iraq uh, and Afghanistan. Um, I also served George W. Bush in the White House uh, as his intergovernmental, one of his intergovernmental affairs office, officers on the uh, governor's portfolio. So I was the liaison between the president and the 55 governors. Um, and then also worked in transportation and public policy at Harvard, where I got my master's in public policy. So you're really 70. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, want, I want Jared to know we have some job openings at the Kempsey Gardner Policy Institute. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> easy. Easy. <laughs> I just merely wanted to brag about what the beautiful Brad is and the whole much knowledge he has and how proud we are to have him in the department and the commission to help us in the state. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chairman. You, you can take off now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. 
Item number eight on your agenda is administrative road review. I think uh, Lyle McMullen's gonna be presenting this item. Am I right? Lyle? That is You're correct. Right? Oh, there yay. <laughs> Go ahead, please. All right, I'm going to ask to I'm actually going to present my entire screen. And by the way, beautiful time, Lyle, for the occasion. Thank you for wearing it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. I have a couple items on the agenda. Uh, the first is a rule and a prioritization framework for that rule, and then some state infrastructure bank applications and de-obligation requests. So today, uh, let's, the first item on the agenda is the proposed rule revision for commission rule R940-3. And some background on that, over the past year and a half, the legislature has amended state code 722 part two state infrastructure bank and therefore UDOT is now proposing to update the Transportation Commission administrative rule governing how UDOT and the commission process state infrastructure bank applications. First, the legislature changed the name of the fund and had that are put forward. Additionally, this year, the legislature made four significant changes to um, eligibility and projects. The first, they modified the definition of an eligible transportation project, uh, including the word to construct parking facilities, and then um, added some flexibility by removing uh, the necessity to support intermodal regional transportation purpose. Next, they expanded the eligibility of transportation projects uh, with, for local governments by including economic development initiatives they also uh, clarified that the prioritization process needed to include project benefits to include political subdivisions, not just the state. And then they also extended, more significantly, they extended the loan repayment term allowed from no later than 10 years to no later than 15 years and uh, capped the amount of additional interest to recapitalize the fund at 50 basis points or 0.5% above bond market base rates available to the state. And as you will see shortly, the proposed rule provides for a prioritization framework based on six criteria that are identified in the statute. And it's intended to provide the commission additionally with the flexibility to use its best judgment in addition to those six criteria. The goal is to provide a framework and tools that allow you to make optimal decisions. All right, so let's go through. Um, I've, I, I've added for your convenience a copy of Senate Bill 15 that passed and highlighted for you where these changes occurred. And now let's get into the rule. Again, this is a revised rule, but there was a previous rule I just got informed that I, my coat was preppy. <laughs> All right. So the, the rule goes through. We first, we are required to state our authority in the statute. And then we define uh, some really simple definitions. Commission means you, the Transportation Commission. Department means us, the Department of Transportation. Uh, we define what what is an eligible public entity that is able to apply for these funds, and then also what um, qualifies as a transportation project under the statute. Next, uh, we go through a process for uh, to make it simpler and more uh, easily understandable for local 
or for public entities to apply for said funds. And then, um, It talks about, uh, it also refers to um, the amount of time, how we calculate the interest rate. And also one of the things that came up yesterday during the staff update is clarify that the statute allows for um, repayment to commence on the sooner of completion date of the project or the date the public entity opens the facility to traffic in the event it's a highway project. And so we also clarified the interest will accrue during that period and be capitalized to make sure that um, everyone is on the same page with how we move forward. Um, we provide some flexibility that the public entity can repay the loans in quarterly, monthly, or yearly installments. And then one of the things that we identified uh, historically is that um, we wanted to make sure and put loan applicants on notice that if they do not go to financial close within 180 days of your approval of an application, then it effectively expires unless they come back and either renew the ter terms with you or provide you with an opportunity to update the terms. Next, we go into the prioritization process that's required by the, the statute. And we'll talk about that more in depth in the next agenda item, but basically, it identifies seven criteria. One um, is really easy. It's availability of money in the fund. And if there is no money in the fund, then the, the next six don't uh, really have a lot of relevance. And then we'll provide a scoring sheet. And then uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, we stated in two places. Number one, that any other provisions that you deem appropriate, you can take into account and that you reserve the right to place requests for a loan or assistance ahead of another request with a higher prioritization score for good cause in a public meeting. All right, so let's head back up. Are there any questions about the rule today? Lyle, do you or someone from your department follow us up on the 180 days deadline to trigger, to call, to say, okay, you haven't used the money, what are you doing? You want to extend or you want to withdraw? Yes, that will be my job. Okay. Any question from Lyle at this point? I appreciate uh, the time you spent with us yesterday, Lyle, to help um, you know get into the weeds and the I's and the T's um, to help explain this. I you, it's it's great, works much better. Thank you. My pleasure. Are there any other questions? If there are any other questions, then uh, it is our hope that you feel comfortable enough to provide a motion to approve this administrative rule R940-3 for filing so that we can start getting it uh, through the process. Uh, what would happen next is we would, we would file it by the next filing deadline, which is next week. And then there's a mandatory 30-day comment period. If we get any comments on it, then we will come bring them back to you next month. And then um, deal with that, but we basically like to get it moving um, so that we can get it updated and in compliance with the changes in the statute. Commissioner, Mr. Chair, uh, move for approval. Uh, sec uh, Commissioner Kramer, I second that with the comment. I appreciate Lyle's work on this. It is a really good start. Uh, the infrastructure and private partnership rules in the state are under consideration, and this is a a key part of that, uh, I personally had some meetings with Senator Hemmert and others, and uh, this is a good good start. But uh, it's, we're not there all the way, but we appreciate all that Lyle's done, as always. So that's my second and my uh, support. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussions, comments, questions? 
I just simply reiterate with all the challenges coming now in funding, this is even more important than it's been before. So appreciate it. Then I would like to ask for name motion from the commissioners. Seeing none, then I will declare item eight as a approved. Thank you. Let's see. At this point, I think that uh, Carlos reminded me that we may not, I may have failed to ask a motion on item two, I 15 project. I thought I did, but I apologize if I didn't. So we need to go back to that. I need to have a motion and a second item seven A dash two project. So moved, Commissioner Evans. Okay. Second, Commissioner Van Tassel. Thank you. So again, nay motion from any of the commissioners. Seeing none, I declare that unanimous vote. My apology to every one of you. Thank you, Carlos, for reminding me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lyle. You have the second item. Yes, sir. Please proceed. All right. Can everyone see agenda item? Number uh, nine, uh, eight, yeah. That is not the one that I'm looking for. <laughs> I'm looking. Oh, actually, okay, it's down below. All right, Am I, are we looking at 8B now? Yes. Excellent. All right. So as I we talked about previously in the R940-3 State Infrastructure Bank revised rule, one of the things in the rule, it refers to a prioritization framework. And today, I didn't do it. <laughs> the um, Proposed prioritization framework provides a six point scoring process based on criteria that were identified in the statute. And as we mentioned before, provides you as commissioners with the flexibility to use your best judgment. In addition to the scoring, we will provide tie distinguishers so that it will aid you in making optimal decisions. And um, I'm gonna go just real quickly like we did yesterday and show you how the, the public accesses it. First, we go to the Transportation Commission landing page on the UDOT website. We go to Commission Policies, Roles, and Guidelines. And there, um, I mentioned yesterday that we talked about the uh, um, fund balance. We'll talk about that in just a second when we uh, go through some of the applications and deobligations. But the piece that I wanted to take you to is how we are going to help put together and utilize the framework to help you uh, make these decisions. And we have here a, an eligible public entity can come in, access the state infrastructure bank application, and we've identified, make sure that it's the right project type, description of the project, um, the statute requires uh, that they identify a dedicated revenue repayment source. This is for the accounting. And then we go through each of the criteria for the prioritization framework. And so we ask the proposer, the applicant, how does your proposed project encourage, enhance, or create economic benefits to the state? Will the loan or the assistance enable the project to proceed earlier than it otherwise would have been possible? Will assistance from the State Infrastructure Bank foster innovative public-private partnerships or attract private investment as part of the project? Does your project benefit the state highway system, including safety or mobility improvement? And does the project financing include local and private participation? And what percentage of the total costs are represented by the State Infrastructure Bank loan that you're asking for? That will be one of the tie differentiators if we have multiple applications. 
Does the project provide intermodal connectivity with public transportation, pedestrian, or non-motorized transportation facilities? And then um, we make, we're trying to make sure that uh, the, app, the applicant is actually authorized to uh, apply for a loan. So going back, let's talk about the actual document. We tried to mirror, mirror it and make it have the same look and feel as the uh, framework for project prioritization. So uh, we go basically, basically what we'll go through is we will take that application and then we will put it through a scoring process. And we're trying to make it as simple as possible. And it's basically binary. If they meet the criteria, or if we believe that they've demonstrated that they met the criteria, they get a point. If they don't, they don't get a point. And we've gone through those six criteria that we just talked through in the loan. And then there will be a score that we will present to you. And if there's more than one application, then we'll provide you with uh, a ranked list that you can then use your judgment, you can follow the ranking or you can ask additional questions or use your best judgment as to whether or not they uh, qualify for the infrastructure bank loan assistance. What questions do you have? I just love the simplicity. This, this makes it so easy for everyone involved. Right, and as we mentioned yesterday, getting it publicized and available to those who can use it is critical because it just sits there. It's, no, it's not benefiting anybody. Good so, job, Lyle. Thank you. I'd like to say that it was really simple and the process was really easy. Um, <laughs> but this, this is the product of months and months of fine tuning. And Ben, Hewitt and James Palmer played a very significant role in helping us put this together. Okay, so if, um, if you are comfortable, we would uh, appreciate a motion to approve and adopt this infrastructure prioritization framework as part of the new rule. Commissioner Kramer, I so move. Barlow seconds. There's a motion and a second. Any further questions, concerns, comments? Seeing none. May I, may I, may I just ask which legislative leaders are particularly been supportive of this, Lyle, going forward? You probably shared this earlier. I'm just curious. Uh, Senator Colomore has been uh, a, a chief sponsor the last two years. Thank you. Any other questions? Then I would like to entertain a name motion from the commissioners. Seeing or hearing none, then I will declare uh, item 8-B as a unanimous vote. Thank you. Lyle, we have item number nine still. Yes, and then I realized we were going to yesterday. Ivan drove, and then about ten minutes before we, this was supposed to start, Ivan offered me the uh, the opportunity to uh, drive, and so I thought I had everything set up, and then I realized that I forgot this very important part here for you. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Uh, do you want me to pull it up? Yeah, please. There you go.
that what you wanted? I'm just seeing you. Yeah. Item nine. That's the one. What, what I'm looking for is the um, fact. I'm just going to go into my sense here. What I'm looking for is the balance. An obligations report. All right, I will. Um, I'll take it back. Okay. So much fun. All right, I appreciate everybody's patience. What we have here today is the the state infrastructure bank balance and obligations. And the piece that allows me. Can everybody see this okay? Well, we don't have anything yet. Um, I see Do you it. not. Okay. The state infrastructure bank balance and obligation sheet. Yes. I can see it. This is Barlow. Yeah, I can see it. Yes. Yes. All right. There we go. Just, so as we, um, because it is a revolving loan fund and there's money going in and money coming out, similar to my experience with the quarter preservation, the Marta Dilray quarter preservation revolving loan fund, um, to keep the same look and feel, I had developed something like this for the quarter preservation fund. And so we adopted this as well for the state infrastructure bank. And it's a tool that we've found useful to help bring you, because it's been six months since I've been before you, this will bring you up to speed so that we can, uh, you can understand where we are financially and budgetarily for the, the obligations and the, and the, the application that I have for you today. So our balance forward is, see if we can get that a little bigger, it's about $20.9 million. When we met last time in September, you approved a SIB loan to Provo City for their airport terminal expansion. We, we reached financial close on that in February for $5 million. And today we have for you two D obligations, one for St. George City for 4.7. It's a loan that you approved back in April, 2018 that they have chosen uh, not to pursue any longer. And then Midvale City had a three and a half million dollar loan that you approved last September that they would like to deobligate a portion of. So when you add those two deobligations, it will add, so you subtract the 5 million, add the 6 million, that gives us a, a subtotal of $22 million. There are two projects, loans that you've approved previously that have yet to close. Um, these two are related, the 1.3, when you subtract the one, when you deobligate the 1.3 million from Midvale City, what remains is 2.16 million. And back in February of last year, you approved a $23.2 million SIB loan application. And uh, because of budgetary constraints, Salt Lake County took down all but 450,000 of it. So that is still obligated, but not yet dispersed. When you subtract those, that leaves us with a fund balance of 19.4 million. And then we'll have an application today from Midvale City for a project of theirs, that's five and a half million, subtracting that from the 19.4. And um, last year, the legislature capitalized the SIB fund with $5 million and directed us to hold it for the Utah Inland Port. 
So we're holding that in reserve for them. When you subtract those two, it leaves us with an unobligated balance if all the applications and requests today are approved of $8.9 million. Are there any questions about the fund balance and obligations today? Okay, if not, then let's go ahead and get into the agenda item. All right, does everybody see 9A? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, so the first agenda item we have for the SIB account is a $4.735,000 million, $4 million state infrastructure bank loan de-obligation request from St. George City. Back in April of 2018, uh, the commission approved this loan for St. George for an interchange on the Southern Parkway. Uh, due to uh, reason, the developer has since communicated to St. George that they are no longer intended to construct the interchange. And if they do, they don't uh, need any assistance. And so St. George sent us a letter asking for us to deobligate the funds and make them available to somebody who would use them. So I'm coming to you today with a request for a motion to approve the deobligation of $4,735,000 to be re-added into the SIB loan balance. Barla moves for approval. Gochner will second. Okay, there's a motion on the second. Any further discussions, questions, comments? Seeing or hearing none, I declare item 9-A unanimously approved. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Did you ask for a nay, any nay votes? Yes, I did. Okay, sorry I missed that. Yes, yes. Uh, do, you want, do you want to note that Commissioner Van Tassel doesn't have audio? Yes, I did that. Sorry. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. I thought for a minute, though, he connected. Did he come back? Um, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe maybe we could redo that one just to clarify for the record. Okay. I would like to have a nay motion from the commissioners on this item 9-A. Should that be a, vote, a nay vote? Nay vote. Because yeah. we had we had a motion and a second, and we'd be asking for a, a nay vote. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Again, seeing none, I declare unanimous vote on item nine A. Thank, Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a $1,336,107 SIB loan de-obligation request on behalf of Midvale City. As we discussed earlier, last September, Midvale City applied for and the commission approved a SIB loan for $3.5 million. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about in today's meeting that we did yesterday was that the legislature uh, capitalized the SIB fund last year was $7 million and directed UDOT to provide access to Midvale City for it. Uh, they came to us last September, asked for three and a half million dollars of it for a parking structure project near Bingham Junction track station that will enable CHG Healthcare to expand their operations. And that is this piece right here that's cross-hatched. This is 7200 South, I-15. And so uh, this will enable them to move this surface parking into a vertical parking structure and allow them to build a new office building and create jobs and then have jobs in the office building uh, moving forward. It's close to the tracks building and uh, over the intervening, what, seven, eight, nine months, um, they've come back to us and said they only needed uh, 2.1 of it. Oops. 2.1. So um, if you deobligate per the request of 1.3 million, it effectively changes the previously approved loan amount to $2,163,893. Uh, 
for the exact same term, 10 years at 2.35%. Are there any questions about this fee obligation request? Okay, if there aren't any and you feel comfortable, we, I, I'm asking for a motion to de-obligate $1,336,107 from your September, SIB, September 19 SIB loan approval to Midvale City. So moved, Commissioner Evans. Law second. So there's a motion in the second. Any further discussions, questions, comments? Good plan. Support it. Yeah. Okay. I would like to ask for a nay vote from the commissioners. Seeing or hearing none, I declare item number 9-B as stated as presented unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then we next move into the the next and final item on the agenda for me, 9C, which is a five and a half million dollar state infrastructure bank loan, again, for Midvale City. Um, you'll recall that uh, in 2019, they provided funding and direction to the SIB for Midvale for um, parking structures in proximity to an intermodal transportation facility that enhances economic development within the city. And the first project that we talked about was uh, there by the Bingham Junction track station. This next second project that they're applying for funding for is down below So this is where the project um, the first project is, and then if you go down below Center Street over by um, the historic Gardner Village, then that is where this second place is, the second development. And I've got a blow up here for you. This is where they propose to help with the parking structure. That's the loan request. The city has submitted an application for five and a half million dollars for this project and proposes to use redevelopment agency revenues to repay the loan. It's requesting currently due to the statutory limitations and well, the rule limitation, a payback term of 10 years with repayment commencing upon project completion in two years per the statute. The corresponding interest rate at the time of their receiving their completed application was 2.65, which is 2.15% plus the statutory 0.5%. Additionally, the city is requesting a contingent approval to convert to a 15-year term when the new SIB rules that you allowed us to file becomes effective. Are there any questions about this SIB loan application? Lyle, just one quick question. When did we agree that the rules become effective? Is that immediately? The new SIB rule 940? No. It will, uh, we will file it. There's a process that we have to go through. We'll file it by the filing deadline of June 1st, and then it will be published a couple of weeks later. And then there'll be a mandatory 30 day comment period. So it's, it's, and then if, um, if there are no um, adversarial or um, comments that cause us to, to want to revise the rule even further, then it will go into effect in August. Thank you. Okay. It's pretty quick in the world of government rule changes. Great. So, Lyle, are you... Uh looking for a motion yes and so the motion as you see it's basically there's twofold number one first motion to approve 
five and a half million dollar SIB loan to Midvale City for 10 years at 2.65 repayment commencing in two years. And then an additional motion to approve converting that loan to a 15 year term at the same terms upon rule 940-3 becoming effective. Mr. Chair, I would like to make both of those motions. I need a support and second. Very supportive of Commissioner Lott, ending all times. I second. <laughs> Thank you. There's a motion and a second to approve those two items back to back. Any further discussions, questions, concerns? Seeing none, I would like to ask for a nay vote from the commissioners. Regarding these two items. Seeing or hearing none, then I will declare this item number 9-C unanimously approved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioners. Good job, Lyle. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. You do the same. Thank you. So that concludes our agenda items. I remind the commissioner that the next meeting will be June 25th and the 6th. It was slated for Logan. We don't think we're going to make it, but we're hoping and praying for September 17, 18, maybe Farmington meeting in person, live. Any other uh, reports from the commissioners? Any kind of concerns that you have you would like to talk about? Mr. Chairman, don't we also have an August meeting slated for Roosevelt? Yes, but I just wanted to give the good news first that, that September that we're shooting and we're hoping that we'll have the UTA commissioners to come report on that okay. day to make it centralized. Okay. Yes, okay. We're on the June 25 and 6, Logan, August 13, 14, Roosevelt, but we're talking to Carlos and the leadership, we're thinking that September will be more appropriate time for meeting in person. Uh -huh. Mr. Chairman? Yes, go ahead, please, Carlos. Thank you. So, uh, uh, Commissioner, um, we are, it's hard to guess how things are gonna shake out right now. Um, I would anticipate the next phase of our commission meetings, you know, as we, you know, we're currently in this all electronic, all in individual places. The next phase would probably be a transition where we would establish an anchor location. That anchor location would be most likely here at the Department of Transportation in our large conference room where we have a better ability to control the idea of social distancing and to make sure that we have the right amount of people in the room. Um, and I would anticipate if we can do that in June, that would be a great progression or maybe August is that progression as well. And as uh, the chairman said, um, we're hoping that we could start to get back into a little more normal flow of getting the commission into the communities to hear from the communities themselves in the September time. Frame. So that's what we're thinking. Um, I think one thing we've learned in this world now is everything changes pretty quickly and we'll be nimble to try to apply it. Thank you, Carlos. Jason, anything from you? Terry, anything, any further thing you would like to discuss? Any guidance? <laughs> guidance is enjoy the weekend, enjoy time with your family, and uh, look forward to, to moving all of this forward. Did you clean the droppings from behind your window, Jason? I, I have not. That's going to uh, require some safety gear that I don't currently have. Well, okay. <laughs> Terry, anything from you? I concur with Jason. Not about the bird droppings, but about everybody <laughs> having a good weekend. Well, thank you, my friend. Anybody else? Yeah. Thanks for the great roads we have to ride on if we get out of town. So thank you. Well, just the last item of the agenda, I need to make sure that by way of roll call that everybody was present, that they did not fall asleep, and they followed the agenda to the end. I start from Commissioner Barlow. 
I'm still on board. Thank you, Commissioner Kramer. Every minute of every word. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Commissioner Law, you still yes. with us. Thank you. Commissioner Evans. Here, awake and happy. Thank you. <laughs> and singing. <laughs> you'll be glad, Lou. You'll be glad when we get these things off the video so I can keep my mouth shut and get back to this normal stuff. I, yeah, I we, we love you no matter what. You we love keep it. Playing. No matter what. You keep, we you keep we playing do. and sight in the corner. <laughs> Commissioner Van Tassel, did you get back to, with the sound system? Yes, we did. Yay, thank you very much. And Commissioner Cogner. Here and standing strong. Thank you, Nagi. Thank you, my friend. And again, thank you all and extend our love and appreciation on behalf of Commission to every one of the UDOT family members. Wishing you the best. Stay well, be well till we meet again. I need to have a motion to adjourn, please. So moved. I'll second. Bye, everybody.